This episode brought to you by HelloFresh. Delicious pre-measured ingredients and simple chef-made recipes delivered to your doorstep every week. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Animation for adults has come a long way, hasn't it? <laughs> In other ways, too. You turn on the TV or stream and you'll find tons of animated shows that aren't meant for kids at all. And many of them have a lot of comedy that's as top-notch as anything live action, if not more. The history of this goes back as early as Gertie the Dinosaur, enchanting both children and adults. In some respects, there's always been something for adults in animation, even when it was seen as kid stuff. Disney always showcased technical and artistic beauty, while Warner Brothers always showcased clever and timeless writing. Though Flintstones was more kid-centered, it demonstrated that primetime animation could be accomplished, opening the door for such groundbreakers as Simpsons, South Park, Rick and Morty, Bojack Horseman, as eh, just to name a few. Even animated kids shows seem more adult. Sneaking in more edgy humor, dealing with mature subjects, and even challenging the way both children and grown-ups perceive the world. Of all the shows I mentioned, though, there's one that's often overlooked, and though it didn't get as much attention, it was no less ahead of its time. That's of course the charming... What the hell are you staring at? Mature... <laughs> politically correct... Get a grip on yourself. Let me rephrase that. Beautifully animated... It thrust your pelvis! Oh, it thrust your pelvis! Oh. Duckman. Chances are you've heard or at least seen clips of this show at some point, but it's rarely talked about or placed in the same category as a lot of these other trailblazers. When you analyze the comedic style, you can see a ton of influence for a lot of hit adult animated shows today. Running from 1994 to 1997 on USA Network, it was the brainchild of Everett Peck, who originally started out as a comic book for Dark Horse. He ended up developing the idea for a then new animation company called Klasky Supo. And if that name or animation style seems familiar, your 90s is showing. A lot of memorable shows came from this studio, including Ah, Real Monsters, Rocket Power, Wild Thornberries, and a tiny little hit called Rugrats. Their style was easy to recognize among children's programming, but Duckman was one of their few adult shows. So a lot of kids that grew up with these hits might not be as familiar with it. But trust me when I say it was doing a lot of what some of your favorite shows today are doing long before they were ever greenlit. The show centers around Duckman, played brilliantly by Jason Alexander, who's a private dick, family man, and all-around perv. You can stuff the Prime Directive where the solar system don't shine. We're talking orbital orgy! His wife Beatrice dies by... Oh, let's just allow her to explain it, shall we? When your cigarette punctured the bullwinkle float and he started losing helium until his antler dipped into the clown car and sent it crashing into Puff the Magic Dragon who bounced off Snoopy and knocked me into an open manhole, I realized this could happen to anyone. And she leaves all the money to her sister Bernice, who hates Duckman's guts. So he moves in with her as well as with her nonverbal grandma who literally communicates through farts. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just stay with me. He has three kids, though if you ask him, he might say two and a half. A dim-witted son named Ajax, and a pair of genius Siamese twins named Charles and Mumbo. His detective job has him teamed up with a stern, no-nonsense partner named Cornfed, clearly satirizing Joe Friday from Dragnet. My life insurance is canceled! Could it be because you attempted to defraud them ten times last month by falsely reporting your own death? There's nothing wrong with marijuana. Well, there's nothing wrong with a gun either until you pull the trigger. And two cuddly assistants named Fluffy and Uranus. What's their story? There are two cuddly assistants named Fluffy and Uranus. It's a miracle every time a new leaf grows, every time a newborn baby cries. Oh, and they often get mauled or murdered, always appearing in the next episode. Oh my god, they killed We'll get to that. The show, as you would imagine, is quite surreal. At the time, animation was certainly trying new things, and it wasn't uncommon to hear a question like, Hey, why are the Simpsons yellow? Now, it doesn't even cross our minds, but in the early 90s, there was kind of this new wave of experimenting as the upcoming generation had a hunger for anything weird, disruptive, and cynical. Duckman checked off all those boxes, but big deal. Lots of shows did at the time, right? Like Beavis and Butthead and Ren and Stimpy? 
Well, while those shows are influential in their own right, listen to some of this writing as well as the delivery from the actors and tell me if it sounds, for lack of a better term, modern. Interesting how the need for substance in an unexamined life oftentimes breeds gullibility. I think the word has just become a symbolic issue for powerful groups that feel like they're doing the right thing. You know the drill. If you make a mess, push it all into a little corner so it looks like you cleaned it up and don't let the police in without a warrant. Jesus, why does Cantaloupe think every time he gets invited to a party, he can bring along his dumb friend Honeydew? You don't get a plus one, Cantaloupe. Check out the nightcrawler I found in the bus station men's room. Three different vibrating speeds, slow, medium, and loss of consciousness. I have to get up there and start living my new amazing life as Felix Fischoder, the condo king with a dark secret. And a girlfriend. There's a fast rhythm that's utilized in the dialogue of modern animation. It's quick, it's smart, it mixes complex words and ideas with simple words and ideas, keeping the energy high and having you guess what's going to be said next. The genius of it is it gives you little to no time to let the joke sink in because it's already moving on to the next joke. This type of writing is being used more and more, as well as being sped up faster and faster. And this show was doing that over 25 years earlier. Now, it's not to say shows like The Simpsons weren't playing with timing and quick jokes, but it was only at a slightly faster pace, which is one of the many reasons it caught on. It was new, but made sure that you got every joke that they said. With Duckman, it didn't care if you missed a joke, it was too busy moving on to the next one, meaning you had to watch it again in order to catch everything. Well, the only disease I've got is modern life. A schnut-busting gauntlet of inefficiency and misery that's one long parade of letdowns, put-downs, trickle-downs, shutouts, freeze-outs, sell-outs, numb-nuts, nick-and-puts, and nimrods! In the age of streaming, downloads, and still hard copies? This is not a new idea. In fact, it's encouraged, so you go back and see it again. But back then, if humor was this fast, it was seen as a little too advanced. People are done with their work days. They don't want to pay too much attention or think too hard about a joke they just heard, let alone several. But now, it's the norm. Another element is just how far it wanted to push being an adult show. Keep in mind, this is before South Park and during a time when shows like Beavis and Butthead and Simpsons were seen as shocking and controversial. Duckman took it a step further and didn't care who it offended, often taking pot shots at sex, gender, race, politics, and mixing it all with a healthy dose of good old-fashioned bad taste. We used to spend entire evenings together watching warm, idealized families and non-threatening singing and dancing minorities. The reason this so often worked is because Duckman himself was a jackass. I mean, a duck. A duck ass. You ever notice how much they focus on duck asses in Disney cartoons? Somebody questioned this. Sorry, I guess I tracked. Duckman is a horny jerk, often getting himself into trouble that his friends and family have to get him out of. But he also lives in an insane world, a world of extremes that rarely makes sense. Whatever time period you live in, there's always going to be something hypocritical about it, because we're flawed and we'll never be perfect. Because of this, oftentimes it's the people who care the least that'll be the most honest. So it only makes sense that a self-absorbed jerk can get away saying things that are true because nicer people are too polite to say anything. So even though he's a scumbag, we side with him because he never lies about being a scumbag. He embraces it, and therefore we know what we're getting is genuine. And even on that note, he does try to get better. In some episodes, he tries to figure out why he's so awful. I mean, he is a father looking after three kids and trying to help others out as a detective. So there is a sense of self-improvement that draws us to him as well, even if it is hidden behind a porno stash of flaws. And, surprisingly, even a character who talks like this... No rectal probes, okay? I'm saving some things for my next honeymoon. ...can have some incredibly poignant words that are just as meaningful today as they were back then. Honestly, even more so. It thrust your pelvis! Oh, it thrust your pelvis! Oh, it thrust your pelvis! Again, stay with me on this. So tell me, hello, fresh. What do you think the problem is? I can tell you what the problem is. You are too delicious. This is why you are America's number one meal kit. You make cooking at home look fun and easy. Shut up, your recipes are delicious. There's something for everyone, including low-calorie, vegetarian, and family-friendly recipes every week. I said shut up, you save time and stress effortlessly. You cut out stressful meal planning and prepping, so you can enjoy cooking and getting the dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes, or even 20 minutes with the quick recipe options. I said shut up! HelloFresh can help you eat more sustainably. Their pre-portioned ingredients means there's less prep for you and less food waste. 
<lacht> HelloFresh ist flexible und fit your lifestyle. Easily change your delivery days or food preferences und skip a week whenever you need. Okay. If you won't stop interrupting me praising you, I won't like it. Especially with such incredible recipes like cranberry apple pork chop. As someone who's not a good cook, I appreciate how easy it is to cook for me. <lacht> Your it's America's best value meal kit. And right now there's even a special offer. If you go to HelloFresh.com and use the code Nostalgia10, you will get 10 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use the code Nostalgia10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. What do you think about that, HelloFresh? In that case, you leave me no object favor, did you say? Oh, that's cool. Oh, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm actually a psychologist. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code Nostalgia10 for 10 free meals today. Hey, you can see us at C2E2 in Chicago, Illinois, February 28th to March 1st. Booth 102. We have two panels this year, a Channel Awesome panel Sunday at 3.15, and a Movies Everybody Disagrees With You on panel Friday at 6.45. But if you can't make either of those, drop by Booth 102 to say hi. You can also see us at Midwest Gaming Classic in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, April 3rd to the 5th. We'll have a booth and panels there as well. Drop on by and say hello, we'd love to see you guys there. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitch, Monday through Saturday. Playing a lot of games, telling a lot of jokes, and having a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Man had a lot of brilliantly raunchy and raunchily brilliant episodes. Some of them hold such relevance in today's culture that it's hard not to be blown away by how strong, true, and even moving some of them can be. One that really pops out at me is America the Beautiful, an episode about a group of kids who are looking for a model named America. She was beautiful and inspiring to them, but she seems to have disappeared. So you can guess where this is going. She's beautiful. Timeless. But even more, look at the compassion, the wounded innocence. Yeah, at first it might seem a little too obvious, but they do it so cleverly it's hard not to admire it. Duckman and Cornfed talk to several people who claim they know where America is, and each person represents a different decade of what the American dream was perceived as. As they at first seem nice on the surface, more digging reveals an unfocused dark side that's taking advantage of America and, ironically, doing more harm than good. Understanding America's story, the more and more they come across different people who abused her. Imagine a woman questioning my authority. Dear, will the gentleman be staying for dinner? Speak only when spoken to, kitten. By the end, Duckman comes across America in a junkyard, still beautiful and kind, but tired and beaten down from all the people that exploited her. You only felt something for me after you thought I was gone. There have been times when I've wanted to give up, but if I do, how can I expect things to ever get better? Don't give up, America. You've got to keep going. While the writing here is easy to grasp, it's still nevertheless meaningful and will always have relevance. It ends with all the kids finding her and singing a corny parody of We Are the World on top of a giant pile of garbage and destruction shaped like the United States. What's so brilliant about this is you can take this image in completely opposite ways. Is it that our heroes are so blind to the fact that what they're standing on is garbage and there will never be any hope? Or is it despite all the terrible things that happened, there will always be optimistic people trying to make things better? To this day, I don't know how to accept this, and that just makes me love it even more. But the episode that's definitely making the rounds on the internet is one called Joking the Chicken. It opens with a politically correct comedian trying to win people over with non-offensive humor. As most comedians know, comedy without some form of misery is a contradiction. Laughter is a coping mechanism to deal with pain so we can get on with our lives. Whether it's thrill of being out of your control or just being in an awkward situation, something always has to be out of place to get a laugh. So the idea of taking out everything offensive goes as well as you may think. So this medical caregiver of indeterminate gender says to his or her disabled, or should I say differently abled patient, why do you have a penguin on your head? They're endangered. You suck! Duckman's arch nemesis named King Chicken, played by Tim Curry, the this number reason to love the show. Actually, he'd be higher up. Turns him into a hit by using a formula to manipulate the audience. Duckman sees the crowds howling with laughter at humor that has no misery in it whatsoever, and makes, in my opinion, one of the greatest speeches about comedy ever. 
Now, because YouTube is also a funny place of misery, I'm not allowed to play the entire clip without most likely getting hit. So I'm just gonna read word for word what he said. It's precisely when humor is offensive that we need it the most. Comedy should provoke. It should blast through prejudices, challenge preconceptions. Comedy should always leave you different than when it found you. Sure, humor can hurt, even alienate, but the risk is better than the alternative. A steady diet of innocuous, child-proof, flavorless mush. Demand to be challenged, to be offended, to be treated like thinking, reasoning adults. And raise your children to do the same. Don't let a comedian, a network, a congressional committee, or an evil genius take away your freedom to laugh at whatever you want. That's problematic. I'm triggered! I need my safe place! I mean, place. actually, if you, actually, really if you had that any... You can see why this is still relevant. This is destroying everything. I highly suggest finding the episode and hearing it yourself as, sure, I can read it, but to hear a comedic master like Jason Alexander say it with all the importance a true comedian can breathe into these words is chilling to say the least. Yeah, when I said he's brilliant on the show, I meant it. It would be so easy to see this writing as too preachy, but mixing in strange and off-color remarks with a comedian who truly understands the importance of delivering every word like he believes it with all his heart and soul makes it pretty damn impressive. There's a two-minute straight rant he gives in the episode of Room with a Bellevue, and again, it's way too long to play here, but it's a speech explaining why his anger is seen by many as crazy, and it's both a sum-up of absolute madness and complete unfiltered reality, both at the same time. Somewhere, somehow, they all got chewed up and spit back out. They don't taste like living anymore. Or even if you do luck into the possibility of some fleeting pleasure, like, say, if some nymphomaniac telephone operators with the muscle control of Romanian mat slappers agree to a little strip air hockey, I still drag my sorry butt off the ceiling every morning and stick my face in the reaping machine for one more day. But does anybody really wonder why anybody is hanging on to sanity by the atoms on the tips of their fingernails while life dirty dances on their digits? It's actually kind of mind-blowing this show doesn't get more attention. It feels like it's so made for this time. But part of that could be they knew how to make everybody angry. Even their fans? What I'm referring to is the last episode, which some see either as a brilliant troll move or one of the biggest slaps in the face. To sum up what is a very complicated series of events, Duckman, Cornfed, and Bernice are all getting married to their new loves, when suddenly Duckman's dead wife appears. Since episode one, she's been confirmed as dead, and suddenly, there she is. The explanation? You're alive. Sure I am. Didn't Cornfed ever tell you? Uh, Duckman, I can explain. And on that note, it says to be continued, with a question mark. The show was canceled shortly after. <laughs> yep. This was never resolved, and the writer admitted they had no idea how they were going to get out of it. You see, the writing was kind of on the wall that this would be the last season. So in a last ditch effort, they wrote in this cliffhanger, almost daring them to be canceled after such a bombshell was dropped. It didn't work. It was a Hail Mary without a prayer. The writer admitted he has no intentions of ever revealing what he personally had in mind, hoping to leave it to his heirs. For, as he put it, the inevitable day when Duckman is revived. I guess I could be pretty pissed off by this too, but honestly, it is kind of funny. It's led to a lot of fan theories about how this could have happened. And while some are super angry that they didn't take what they knew would possibly be their last episode and do something more meaningful, there's already so many episodes that did so already. I say go out on what's essentially a middle finger, but such a great middle finger, as only Duckman could provide. After seeing so many great moments, can you see more why this show was so ahead of its time? Doesn't it feel like something you would see now, not over 25 years ago? Look at the crude and shocking comedy of South Park that, yes, yeah, started with that short, but grew more meaningful allegories while still working in that crude and shocking comedy. Look at Rick and Morty with their fast dialogue, hateable main character, and bleak outlook that still has us rooting for them despite being so pessimistic. Bojack Horseman? Christ! A boozy, self-destructive sex sleaze who we side with because he lives in a crazy world populated by humans and animals. For God's sake, Duckman! Horseman! It's all right in front of you! Is this all coincidence? Maybe. But it doesn't change that Duckman was doing this all before them. This is a show that was smart, yet silly. Funny, yet lowbrow. 
sympathetic yet despicable, sensitive yet not politically correct, took no prisoners yet never apologized for it. At a time when animation is becoming more and more grown up, we seriously can't overlook this important stepping stone that, whether inspired the shows of today or not, was already taking several of their steps years earlier. Duckman is hilarious. I couldn't recommend it more. There are DVDs being sold, and if you search for them, I'm sure you can find it streaming somewhere. Trust me when I say, it's well worth the search. This show will offend, mock, and laugh at most of the sensitivities that today's and possibly future cultures will bring us. And all I gotta say is, let's hope it continues to do so. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it so you don't have to. It thrust your pelvis! Oh! It thrust your pelvis! Oh! It thrust your pelvis! Oh! Hey everybody, Doug Walker here. Adopt a Family is this week's charity shout-out. Adopt a Family was founded in 1983 by three Palm Beach County women. They recognized the need to help families who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless due to financial reversal, illness, divorce, death, or other extenuating circumstances. This organization serves residents in Palm Beach County who meet any of the following criteria. Homeless children and their families, lower income, working families in search of affordable housing opportunities, working poor who do not earn enough to support their families, and families in short-term situational crisis. If you look at their site, you can see all the hard work they put into helping so many people get back on their feet, as well as all the wonderful people that have been helped by this great organization that you can help as well. With a four-star rating on Charity Navigator, this is a good one to check out and help out.